genocide expert warns of impending mass violence against Muslims in India. On January 12th, Dr. Gregory Stanton, founder of the organization Genocide Watch, warned that genocide against Muslims in India is imminent if nothing is done regarding the discrimination they face. He announced his prediction during the congressional briefing hosted by the Indian American Muslims Council and Amnesty International. In his speech, Dr. Stanton highlighted the current prime minister's inaction during the 2002 riots in Jugrat, during which more than 1,000 Indian Muslims lost their lives. He also said that Modi uses quote-unquote Islamophobic rhetoric to build his political base and cited discriminatory policies. For example, in 2019, India enacted the Citizenship Amendment Act, which granted a much easier citizen pa citizenship path for religious minorities from neighboring countries, but excluded Muslims. In January 2021, there were also calls, um, Hindu religious leaders openly called for mass violence against Muslims and pledged oaths to make India a quote unquote Hindu Rashtra or a Hindu nation. Saeed Zafar, a BJP spokesperson, stated that Dr. Stranton's claims regarding the violence and discrimination against Indian Muslims was factually incorrect. It is vital to mention that this is not the first time that Dr. Stranton has shared such an opinion. Almost two, dec two decades ago, Dr. Stranton predicted the Rwandan genocide years before its occurrence. Um, so what is he predicting that is going to happen? Mass so um, we could actually watch his statements oh, right really? in this okay, video cool. right here. Imagine that being your like, is that his t the title of his job? Like genocide expert? Um, well, this is what he's internationally known for. He is the founder of Genocide Watch and um, he mm -hmm. has, they have demonstrated a predictive capacity. I mean, I didn't know that's a, that's a thing, but I'm glad someone is doing it. Um, all right, hold on. Let me see if I can. Yeah, let, let's, uh, <laughs> Ghost Bunny is saying claps for genocide right. news. The reason why I think it's okay to clap for this is one, because um, he's sounding the alarm. Uh, mm. He's giving yeah. his opinion, and it's about um, specifically trying to raise awareness about the severity of the issue. It's a little bit more nuanced than he's not saying, let me be clear. He is not saying that genocide is happening right now. Um, and he makes it, he repeatedly emphasizes that genocide is not an event that occurs. It is a process. Like, and there are multiple processes of genocide. So he's raised the alarm about how um, India is meeting eight out of 10 criteria of genocide that um, his criteria that he established many years ago. And that's uh, part of this whole process. But um, do you want to watch his comments? It's good. Like we're getting the vibes that like like nineteen I don't know maybe thirty nine vibe in Germany. Like maybe not up till the you know like pre you know you're getting this you're getting all the signals for something bad majorly bad happening. I mean if you think about it like it does look very scary. I mean I don't know I. I don't know how accurately you could make predictions like this, right? But if predictions are reliable, like if you can actually make your predictions, like you could see like how how bad the, how uh, all the tensions, right? Like you have in India, you see like all the Muslims are under watch and you know one person does something bad and all of a sudden they think like there's a conspiracy and now everybody ev is looking for a Muslim to see if they're doing the same thing or they have the same behavior. And, you know, there's a conspiracy that everybody's doing this or like a Christian. Um, I don't know. There's some forced conversions by some Christians. And now every single church is like involved being forced conversions and every cross is Valentine's Day, you know, Christmas or everything is now signs of forced conversion or some, uh, there was a video of a Muslim looking like they, they spat into a food and now there's this mass conspiracy that have, like all muslims are like spitting in your food and you have to be vigilant and so all of this hate you know all of this pent-up hate and everybody like constantly demonizing muslims at some point it might something like 
I don't know, it's, it's going to get released. All of this, you know, energy is going to get released. And it might be not a small, like it might be something violent, very violent. You know, I'm not talking about like some, you know, cow vigilante, just, you know, or something like that. You know, I'm talking about um, people saying that, oh, we're going to die for our country. We're going to die for Hindu Rashta. We're going to sacrifice our lives for it. And then they want to keep competing with each other on who's more radical. Right. And then one day, one of these crowds, one of these like Hindu nationalist crowds that are like, it's a massive crowd after they keep like doing their salutes and everything they're going to be like okay now let's move over to the friday mosque prayer that is happening right next to us you know what i mean like and imagine like it would be just it would go beyond just like chant you know making threats and like let's carry out this let's show how much we did it how much we're willing to sacrifice our lives for the sake of this hindu right and then if they do something and it would be the like the Islamic community in India, okay? I mean, they have their own radicals, <laughs> right? And they're gonna be like, okay, we need to respond. And it's could like, what could the like okay, I don't want to do the slippery slope fallacy, all right? I'm not saying this is gonna happen, okay? I'm I'm just saying like I can see how it could happen. Right. I'm not saying it will happen. Right. I don't want to say like, oh, this will lead to this and this will differ. But I'm just saying it's not unimaginable for something so disastrous that could happen that could potentially start like, I don't know, it's like a civil war within India. Right. So this is like really, really scary. OK. And then what? Oh, and then here's what here's like, let's make it more scary. OK. Why not? OK. Let's scare the bejesus out of everybody. OK. And then Pakistan could be like hey muslims of india like why are you like we need to protect muslims in india okay we're gonna come help our brethren and blah 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 okay and then i don't know it's gonna be and then oh the taliban uh you know taliban you know there's a lot of islamic groups that want to get involved there's gonna be a whole you know migration of a lot of radical muslims from around the world maybe trying to come into India to defend their uh, brothers and sisters in his jihad. And yeah, there you go. That's a recipe for a, uh, for a civil war or mass mass genocide. Right. I think, Anyways, let's, yeah. Well, I want to elaborate on some things really quickly. What I thought was very interesting because someone is talking about this interview he did with Karan Thapar. I watched that today and he mm. talks about um, how he makes it very clear that in his prediction, there, he never says that this will come from the state. He is very clear in saying that I think this will come from fellow civilians. Yeah, and yeah. Um, his predictions or the, the organization Genocide Watch, their predictions in general are much more specific. So they're mostly predictive um, regarding Kashmir. And they point to a lot of the policies that have been affecting Kashmir recently, including the stripping of their autonomous status, as well as what's going on in Assam. And what's going on in Assam is very complicated, but it has to do with a lot of people who were um, refugees out of Bangladesh during um, the Bangladeshi Liberation War. And um, a lot of them are Muslims, and now their citizenship and status is being contested. And um, there is a lot of um, uh, the, um, mass detention centers that are happening in this area that are hugely problematic, as well as the, just the stripping of um, many Muslims' uh, land ownership um, or allowing them to be on that land. It's a little complicated. Um, so I thought that was really worth mentioning. I thought it was very interesting in particular how he was talking about, like, I don't think that this is going to come from the government. I think that this will come from civilians. And um, he was very harsh on Modi, saying that he is culpable in his refusal to speak out complete silence for over a month regarding these hate speeches that happened in Hardivar and um, Delhi. Yeah, I mean, but he will, he doesn't want to lose his base. That's his base. <laughs> why would he come speak against that? Like, they're like, why would I speak against hate speech? Hate speech is hate speech is you know, hate is what my campaign is fueled on. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? Anyways, like, let's okay, let's. Uh, listen to this. Uh, you have video? Did you see it going? Uh, all right. All right.
in uh, in the, the meeting in Hardwar, and that has been used by the uh, Indian government also against Muslims. It is polarization, uh, which uh, includes this anti-Muslim hatred. And it is the kind of preparation that we are seeing right now where this dehumanization is being preached. So we're warning that genocide could very well happen in India. U.S. Holocaust Museum is right about that. Uh, one of the first genocides that I predicted uh, way back uh, in 1989 was in Rwanda when I lived there. And I could see from the ID cards where it identifies Tutsis and Hutus and Twa and, and so forth, that these cards could be used for genocide. And when I asked the president of the Supreme Court, who was a Hutu himself, uh, couldn't you outlaw this, you know, making these uh, ID cards uh, not have these ethnic identifications on them? He said, no, we don't have judicial review here. So you're going to have to talk to the president. So I got an appointment to talk to President Habir Amana. I went in, we talked. I said, you know, these ID cards could be used for genocide. At that point, and I said, you have to get this off of the cards. A sort of mask went down over his face because he didn't want to hear that. It turned out he was, of course, a leader of some of the genocidal massacres that had occurred earlier in that country. Uh, but as we left that meeting, I said, Mr. President, if you don't do something to prevent genocide in your country, there is going to be a genocide here within five years. That was in 1989. The genocide developed. The hate speech developed. The all the early warning signs developed. And as we know, 800,000 Tutsis and other Rwandans were murdered in 1994. We cannot let that happen in India. Thank you. Well, well, one thing that I think is worth noting that I think people who might be critical of this sudden attention on him might say is that he's been per making predictions about mass violence or genocide in India since around 2001 to 2002, around the time of the riots in Jugrat. So people might say, well, oh, well, now they're just bringing up now because of, you know, uh, the, the BJP's hold on the country. And so it's politically relevant and expedient to them at this time. Um, but he's very clear in when he talks about when when these predictions started out back in those riots back in the early 2000s, who has been largely condemned and implicated in his complicity. Modi. <laughs> so um, I think it's it's still relevant to bring those things up now. Um, what I think is interesting, though, is they're not he's not the only pe person or organization to bring up these concerns. So the um, Genocide Watch, his organization doesn't use a statistical model when they're making these predictions. But the um, uh, well, he already said it, so I might as well. The U.S. Holocaust Museum, they have a project called the Early Warning Project. And the Early Warning Project oh, wow. actually does do statistical analyses and statistical predictions. So they try to put a number on it. And mm -hmm. recently, um, they, they ranked India as the number two country where that is likely to experience mass killings. With uh, They say that there is a 14.4% or approximately one in seven chance of new mass killings beginning in India in 2021 or 2022. India ranks the second highest at risk among 162 countries. Um, and again, a lot of their the concerns- Wait, happen. you're really not gonna tell us what the first is? What's the first? Wait, let me find the um, ranking. Give me a short second. No, sorry, you it, continue. I said you in the to analysis continue. that they have, um, they uh oh shoot <laughs> so in the india one they they highly reference um the issue of kashmir as well but the number one country is pakistan oh wow okay that's why that my sense. reaction was just oh oh shit. that's that um, actually makes a lot of sense 
Yeah, it does. Guys, we're not like, yeah, I hope none of this comes true. In Pakistan, they highlight the issues um, of the uh, Pakistani Taliban, and they also highlight the persecution of religious minorities, specifically naming Hindus and Ahmadis as it has an expanded list uh, expanded risk yeah so 14 14 percent chance for india do you know what chance they predicting for pakistan 15.2 percent 15 okay wow only one percent higher than india okay mm -hmm. all right we do want to highlight some star comments okay yes true um so uh, Shriyash is asking, what are the 10 criterion? So if you want to read the full definition and explanations, I go to genocidewatch.com slash 10 stages, um, because I can't read the full definitions right now. We don't have the time. Um, so the, but the 10 stages are classification, symbolization, discrimination, dehumanization, organization, polarization, preparation, persecution, extermination, and denial and yeah. um some of these things they're not it's not necessarily they're not necessarily linear right they can they're these are processes not linear stages so some of these things can be happening in tandem like he highlighted the role of denial as there is the risk of a country entering a situation like this um and it should be noted that it's not um, exclusively like India that gets these rankings, like, um, the U S is listed, you know, as having a risk for genocide by the same organization. Um, mm. so, no chance. uh, they, that, that was a different organization that actually lists it, um, in a statistical model. Um, mm. let me try to find All right, it. No, no, never mind. This, I want to highlight this one. Okay. Go for it. All right. So Hindutva Susanna is saying, hey, Armin and Susanna, how should a Hindu react when a local Muslim openly supports Taliban and celebrate the death of India's chief defense of staff, um, tragic death, but no moderate Muslims are against it? Okay, Hindutva Susanna, I think like you, the way maybe the people like you, like you who have uh, a collective mindset i think you don't understand you're so fundamentally flawed in the way that you're thinking and that's why when we keep like telling you why you're thinking uh, your mind just doesn't resonate with us who think on an individual basis right like we keep like telling you and other people like not to treat muslims like this or that or not you know and then you're like, but they did this, but they did that. And you keep giving us examples of like things that have happened. And you think that's a justification for all these other, for, a, for how you view Muslims or how Hindutva is supposed to be treating Muslims or how they're supposed to be looking at them. Right. But instead of, I don't know, because, and we have constantly pointed out to you that the, we don't we don't look at all of these people as one collective right um but i think it just doesn't you just don't get it right because people who are tribal people who associate themselves like oh i'm hindutva and these are muslim we're part of hindutva and these are muslims and we're just enemies or something like that um it does it seems like no matter how much how much we try to try to make them understand that we judge people on an individual basis rather than holding them collectively responsible it just doesn't resonate with them they just don't get it they're so tribal that they see that action of one muslim as a way to hate or be against or judge all of these muslims together right and the only time they get it when we're talking about is when we talk about members of their tribe right so for example, Hindutva, here, let me, let me make this easier for you to understand, okay? Because th that's the only language you understand is by making it, you know, give an example of your tribe, right? You know for a fact th that there are Hindutva, all right, that has members of Hindutva that have done things that you do not endorse, 
you yourself here, I know I've seen, right? Like we highlighted some of these far right, like extremist radical Hindutva that we highlighted here on the show. And you were like, oh, that's a fringe group of people. Oh, those, those are just like a few people, this and that, right? Uh, and you want to, when we show examples of Hindutva doing crazy things, you want to isolate that and be like, oh, that's just them. That's not, you know, all Hindus or all Hindutva, okay? But when it comes to Muslims, all of a sudden you're like, look at this. You know, you, you want to take an action of one Muslim, right? And you want, you, you're bringing that up like on a new segment, right? That is about warning, warning you about genocide against Muslims, right? So think about like the implications of what you're suggesting, right? You think like, every, like we, we, we are here condemning people that are threatening Muslims with violence and with discrimination, right? And you come here and you're like, you act like, well, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to behave? Look at this Muslim. Look at this example of this Muslim, that example of that Muslim, right? You want to hold, you are maybe not on purpose, okay? But this kind of language is like, well, what are we supposed to do? Like what they're doing. So you want to, you are, you are maybe without knowing it, okay? Justifying, you know, a, a, a lot of violence and a lot of discrimination because of the action of some people. Do you understand that just because many some Muslims are a member of a community of people that have done that some of them have are responsible for certain crimes or certain attitudes you can't hold all of them responsible for something like that and you and when you say no modern Muslims are against it okay you did you, the level of responsibility okay of members of a community to call out something is not as high, high as you think okay you can't we don't expect everybody to go out of their way and constantly condemn every single thing that happens within their community right like we don't do that sometimes some some atheists do that right if if hindus like if some hindus do something radical right we call it out okay but we don't expect every Hindu to call it out. What? What? It's not their business. They didn't do it. They don't. They don't have to apologize for it, right? People have their lives. Like we don't expect. Like, if an atheist goes and does commit a crime in the name of fighting a religion, right? You know, we don't expect every single atheist to come and like I condemn that. You know, I mean, if they do, that's great. We don't expect every Hindu person to come out and call out and say, like, we condemn crimes of these Hindutva. I mean, if they do call it out, that would be amazing, right? But it's not an expectation. Why? Why, why, should, I, why, why should they condemn it? They didn't do it. Are they guilty if they don't condemn it? Are they, are they supposed to now go find every single bad thing that a member of this community does and make sure that they condemn it? Are they now responsible if they don't condemn it? If they condemn it, we're grateful for it. If they don't, it's, we don't, we don't want, it's guilt by association. We, they're not more responsible. Everybody is equally responsible to call it out. They're not more responsible to call it out just because they happen to be part of that community. Does that make sense? It makes complete sense. I think you spoke very eloquently about that. Um, mm -hmm. Here's another example of this exact same mindset of guilt by association uh, and uh, collective guilt. Harish mm. is saying people who have committed actual genocide are giving sermons to victims of genocide. How cute. Conflating us <laughs> with communists. Wait, no, I think I thought he was like Gregory Santon. Where is he from? I thought he was like he's American. <laughs> OK, so maybe he's talking about him. I think he's talking about us as atheists against the victims of genocide being Hindus okay, at the Harris, hands what of Muslims. Do, what, explain to us um, what brand of stupid are you? 
<laughs> are you blaming me and Susanna for genocide or are you blaming Gregory for genocide? <laughs> Susanna, the where people was your last demand genocide? answers. What brand of stupid are you? Harish, Harish, what brand of stupid are you? Tell us. What brand of stupid? Tell us. Tell us. No, okay. But if it's us, I haven't committed genocide since a week at least. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> I've been sick lately. I've been under the weather. Okay. So I took the week off. <laughs> I took the, I don't know. All right. Oh my god. I don't, I don't know about Susanna. She's she's white. They, oh they do, man. <laughs> they do genocide in, every morning. Um <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. All right. There's, there's somebody in the live chat that's saying, you get a genocide. You get a genocide. <laughs> wait, yeah, I want to know. <laughs> wait, where's that comment? The one highlighted. Anyways, I can't, I don't know why it's not showing up here. All right. I'm going to put this over here. See if you want to highlight anything else in the comments while I bring up the next news. Um... I just like de rolling her eyes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, I have. Oh, here's another hmm. comment. Amir is saying, My response to Hindu, uh, Hindu Susanna is the modern Muslims often are scared to come out as the community, as the community is hostile. So, welcome the Muslim together, make it safe. Yeah. Um, Oh, actually, that's a, one thing else I want to add to that is like, we don't, if we want to blame any individual Muslim, and when we say blame, not like blame as in they're responsible for, they, they are responsible for violence or that they deserve discrimination for it. They're just like, just call, if we want to call out, if we want to condemn, and not, not just a Muslim, anybody, okay? Um, no, not condemn. If we want to call out anybody, it's not the people who are not, condemning the violence or condemning um we want to call out the people who make excuses for it right so for example among muslim moderates if there's a muslim moderate that doesn't say anything i mean muslim moderates i mean they have lives they're not like they have a you know they are they have family they have jobs they're not going to sit there and like let me see what like <laughs> imagine if you imagine it, like you're a muslim moderate they're like okay i have to do my duty as a muslim mother today and i'm gonna go online and check what muslims have been up to lately like oh that that's horrible okay i have to condemn that on facebook okay what else or like mm, this happened in somalia okay let me make a facebook post on that i condemn this as well uh what else oh okay that happened in afghanistan okay i have to do this this is my responsibility as a mother muslim i condemn taliban um hitting that woman in the street of kabul Oh my God, this list is like, okay, so like, <laughs> this is a very long list. That's a very long list. Like, I okay, I maybe have to, like, yeah. So imagine that being the responsibility of every mother Muslim. Okay, so we don't, we don't have that expectation. But if a mother Muslim comes and makes excuses for, I don't know, Taliban, you know, in, in, in being abusive to women in Kabul or something like that, okay, then we're like, okay, that's like, no, nope, yeah, yeah, we're going to call that out, okay? We're gonna call it out. We're not gonna condemn silence, but we will condemn making excuses for it. Um, and and by calling out again, that doesn't mean that they deserve anything bad happening to them. We're just like, hey, that's that's bad. <laughs> that's not good. That's all. That's all. Okay. And again, if we do call it out, it's not because they're a moderate Muslim. Anybody else who was also making excuses for Taliban, I don't know, like let you know, we would like their being a moderate Muslim has nothing to do uh, with the, with the fact that we're calling it out. Okay, it's it's the it's the ideas that they're spreading is how nonsensical the what they what they're saying is that makes we're just judging it based on the merits of the argument or lack thereof. Okay, no, we don't check your identity, we don't check your association before we decide whether what you're make, is saying makes sense or not. Anyway. Um, and just to be fair, 
I will say that Genocide Watch has reported that U.S. meet the United States meets six, six criteria out of ten, so that's only two behind India. Um, oh wait, and this is an interesting question. Kenneth is saying, how many people does one need to murder for it to be genocide? It's not measured by mm -hmm. the amount of people. It's measured by well a number of things, but one quick definition is an effort and intent to eradicate in whole or in part a group of people on the basis of their religion ethnicity uh background etc cetera, etc cetera. group identity exactly so the, in, like for... the, the in part is actually very important because they're like oh well they're still here right they exist it's like but there was an effort to go after at least a yes a, so, a section a, s a smaller sample etc yeah, like, for example, right now, the greatest human rights violation of, you know, in the world, um, the gr greatest human, right, uh, human rights crisis right now in the world is in Yemen, right? And the numbers are massive, um, and it's not a genocide, right? Like, it's, it's a massacre of people. It's a mass massacre of people. Um, but because it's not based on ethnicity or anything like that, um, it's not genocide, right? Um, it could be argued that, you know, it's sad that if it's not a genocide, it doesn't get as much attention, right? So people are saying, some people might say, like, if it, if, we, if, we, if we could get labeled as a genocide, then maybe the Yemeni situation would get more attention. I mean, technically, it's not a genocide, right? Even though the numbers are devastating. Um, but I think I've heard some arguments for why it makes sense for paying it, you know, for the label of genocide getting a lot more attention, but that's a different argument. Atheist Republic needs your help. We have been the target of many legal attacks by Hindu nationalists ever since our founder, Armin Ababi, blasphemed against Hindu deities. We have retained legal counsel to help us defend our access to our community in India. We have started a fundraiser that will help us afford to tackle many legal issues, including judicial harassment and censorship. Whatever you can contribute will go a long ways in helping us in this fight. Link in the description below.